Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today, I have with me artist Paula Stern. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Happy to meet you. Yes, good to meet you, even if remotely someday, hopefully in person. Well, I've heard so much about you, and uh, I feel like I've become a member of the Portland Art Gallery fa extended family. <laughs> well, I know that we feel the same way about you, and it's wonderful because you're actually located out of state, so having the opportunity to connect with you this way is pretty special. Amen. I agree. Well, I'll be coming back up to Maine next week, and... Uh, I uh, get there as often as I can. Excellent. So, because you do actually have a main connection. In fact, you've you've lent us your daughter. Yes, and uh, we should spell Maine uh, with and without an e in that case, because my daughter is very special, and uh, uh, her family uh, is growing, and we're. Um, uh, n there's not an. I I want to be there full time. And um, I try to come up very frequently. She is a uh, uh, very active pr practicing pediatrician and she needs some, you know, help <laughs> from her, from, from uh, what we call Nona, which is grandma for uh, the, her kids. Well, I'm glad you're able to do that. I know I appreciated that when my kids were growing up and my parents' involvement, and I think it has led to a very close relationship. Never enough time. I absolutely uh, uh, recognize that uh, they're, they're, they're not my only grandchildren. I have two in Manhattan as well uh, who came, came ahead of my two little boys in Maine. But uh, it, it, there's, it, I, I wish I could transport myself daily there. So that's where your son is living is Manhattan. Right. <clears throat> he is. And uh, I guess in this day and age, uh, everybody's a little peripatetic. Um, my uh, uh, daughter-in-law, uh, my son's wife is from Italy. <clears throat> so uh, uh, their children know no national borders. <laughs> They're really traveling all the time, uh, both in terms of language and, and just mentality. And um, it's 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 a uh, it's a it's a wonderful world, despite the fact that we're uh, uh, talking at a, a really tough time in history. And you're currently located in Virginia. I'm right in Washington D.C. <clears throat> I'm uh, right near what uh, the National Cathedral, the the zoo. I'm ten minutes from the White House. And uh, Washington has uh, been our home for uh, uh, pretty much my entire working career. And uh, the kids were raised here. And uh, we were just talking, my daughter and I, uh, yesterday, uh, that there's a new book out that kind of says, you know, Washington is not just the swamp. Uh, the people came here and still do. Uh, because they're drawn here by public service and the desire to do public service. And um, uh, I uh, think I'm part of that. In my family, my brother preceded me here. Um, he was a civil rights lawyer uh, in the, uh, when it was really, really tough times and uh, sent back to our home in the South. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and uh, uh, came up north for study and public service. Tell me about your background not as an artist. I, I know we know you through the Portland Art Gallery as, as, a, as a sculptor, but your background not as an artist is equally as impressive. Well, thank you. Um, I'm... Uh, was very lucky because my parents prepared me not only as an artist and a dancer, but uh, intellectually um, to care about the rest of the world and, if you will, trying to make a better place for um, our community and our uh, kids' futures. And uh, I 
ended up uh, after graduating from <clears throat> public schools in Memphis, uh, going to college uh, in the Baltimore area, Galter College. It was a woman's college at the time. Um, I'm of that generation where um, not only was there segregation uh, when it came to Jim Crow laws, but uh, very much uh, segregation when it came uh, at least, uh, to uh, the choices of, of uh, colleges and universities I could attend. And I was lucky enough to go to a woman's college, uh, which I think encouraged me and gave me even greater confidence. And uh, ended up uh, at Harvard in graduate school um, and then got my Ph.D., um, at uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, which is Tufts University, jointly ad administered by Harvard and Tufts, and uh, had a journalism career. Uh, at the same time, I was doing journalism, writing, uh, starting back in college, worked at the New Republic, at the Atlantic Monthly, published there. Uh, and most of the, some of my proudest, uh, that I'm most proud of articles, were on uh, women, uh, womanly image, character assassination through the ages, kind of uh, polemics, if you will, uh, trying to push the barriers. And I went off as a journalist as a young mid-20s uh, to the Middle East, um, traveling all alone, writing. I ended up coming back um, and, and deciding um, with my uh, husband now, uh, uh, that Washington was the best place for us both to, uh, to be doing um, our professional lives. So I worked on the Hill uh, as a Senate, uh, 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 what we call legislative assistant, to wonderful, terrific gentleman um, uh, who was the father of Earth Day, Gaylord Nelson, Senator Gaylord Nelson. And uh, uh, actually did some of the very, very first work on the issues of uh, arm sales and uh, the concern that uh, that I had and ultimately uh, the Congress that law, law got passed that said that major arm sales should be reported to Congress before they, they get out of here uh, and go uh, become uh, in, enmeshed in our foreign policy and our commitments uh, overseas. And... Uh, I, uh, that took me basically uh, to uh, the Carter administration's uh, attention uh, because that was one of his issues that he ran on along with human rights and foreign policy that I was also writing books about. And um, I was appointed very young um, to be a commissioner at the U.S. International Trade Commission and I ended up chairing it there. And uh, it was a 10-year uh, assignment. And Ronald Reagan by then was uh, in, and I was appointed by him to be the chair of the International Trade Commission, which at that time, when he was in, made me the second highest ranking woman in the government. So I, uh, you know, hit some, hit some glass ce ceilings, got through some. Um, I won't tell you about the times that I didn't get through, uh, but I keep persisting. And uh, at the time that I was... Uh, Doing all of that, I was also sculpting. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I kind of made that a secret because I didn't think I'd be considered, you know, I don't know, professional enough if I was also had this artistic side. And um, but the time came after 9-11 um, uh, that I wanted to cast uh, many of my terracotta works in bronze. I wanted something that when I saw those buildings come down, I just somehow I remembered uh, there was a clip from the New York Times of a remnant of a foot. I think it was a Degas that had been in one of the office buildings um, that came through uh, the disaster and, because it has been cast in bronze. And I said, and, uh, I, I had a friend who uh, had a, a foundry, and I said, I'm, I'm going to start casting then. And that then made me want to um, uh, <clears throat> come out, if you will, publicly as an artist. I, I wanted to um, cover my costs uh, uh, of the investment in the casting and then um, demonstrate with all the 
uh, requirements that some, sometimes are needed, um, you know, to, to have that dual professional credentials. So I understand that even your husband at the time didn't know that you were, had begun sculpting. Is that right? No, that's absolutely correct. You're absolutely right. It was it was really quite hilarious I, uh, because all through college and graduate school and my journalism and the first five years of our marriage when we were both, both working on the Hill, um, uh, <clears throat> I did not sculpt. And um, I... I uh, <clears throat> Uh, it came the time that um, once uh, I, I became pregnant and then gave birth to our first child, Gabriel, um, I had the opportunity to, quote, stay home uh, and get my dissertation ready for the book that I published, Water's Edge. Um, domestic politics and shaping American foreign policy. And while I was uh, at home, uh, the first thing I did, um, besides nursing our son, our baby son, Gabriel, is that I went out and bought clay. And I had no model. The only, all I had was a mirror. And I basically would observe myself nursing our son in front of the mirror. And so my first sculpture um, with that clay was this uh, little uh, piece. And um, Paul came home and saw what I was doing. He was still going to the office and he was just stunned. He had no idea, but I hadn't stopped since. And my, I won't, my son is now 40 something years old. And uh, so uh, that that was the uh, uh, and Paul has been incredibly supportive, my husband, of all of my work, not only just helping me carry stuff, but uh, he, he'll tell me sometimes, Paula, you're finished with that piece. <laughs> Just sometimes, you know, I I'm I'm always trying to get my hands back on something as long as it's still wet <laughs> and, and if it's terracotta. <laughs> You've had pieces that are displayed really in very prominent places, you know, businesses, schools. Um, you've done pieces, I think, Nelson Mandela, Bill Clinton. How, how have you had that type of access? It's really quite impressive. Well, um, the, the Bill Clinton story, President uh, Clinton, um, our family has, has known him uh, since the time he was the governor down in Arkansas. And so he and, and his family, um, uh, have, we've grown up, you know, the kids grew up uh, together. And when they moved to the White House, um, you know, that meant uh, that uh, – my son and 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 and, and Chelsea, I, I watched her grow up, and they they would come over. He, she would come over here, as a matter of fact, and um, and they would play in the clay. The to come, and I still have pieces. Actually, I just thought of that uh, upstairs because they're beautiful um, that they did together uh, with my clay, I guess, and um, so. Um, I, uh, uh, that, that kind of explains that story. And the Mandela um, was one that I did really um, thanks to a commission from a school in South Carolina, uh, Pinewood Prep, Prep School. They have this beautiful garden. Uh, and by the way, I think sculptures, you know, you should think outdoors as well as indoors. Um, and I, I love to put my my work in nature and have it talk, you know, to nature. Um, and they have this garden of the of the great or the, the righteous. Uh, it's just an homage to different wonderful people in history. And they wanted a Mandela, and so I uh, was contacted uh, and uh, did it. Uh, I did not 
uh, have the honor of meeting Mandela. Uh, I did have a lot of photos, uh, of course, throughout his life, which makes things complicated because you have to choose as an artist, what is the expression? What is the age? What is it that you're trying to express as well as getting a likeness? And um, uh, one of my very dear friends gave me a lot of photos that she had taken because she had had the honor uh, of, of meeting with him. And so that that's, explains the Mandela, if you will. And then I, you know, I've done uh, friends who federal judge uh, years ago. He was a very young federal judge and he wanted to have a piece uh, uh, for posterity and uh we did that over an extremely hot, long weekend here in Washington, D.C. when he came down with his family and they went off. And but he and I just worked together uh, to get the piece of, of uh, Mark Wolf, who was a federal judge now uh, in a retired status uh, in Massachusetts. And do I understand that you also have a special connection with another very famous um, Supreme Court judge that recently passed? Ah, oh, the RBG. <laughs> That's a crazy story. Uh, yes, I, ha you know, I had met her. And again, you know, I've been extremely fortunate um, and uh, to be um uh, uh, in a position to meet and, and know people um, and uh, see them uh, personally and meet them uh, and, and some, you know, converse with them, uh, friends in some cases with them. But uh, th th what happened with the uh, RBG uh, really is thanks to the Portland Art Gallery. Um, I had done a piece uh, which I called Ruth. It's, it's in the other room. And uh, it, 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 it's a, a lovely piece, a full figure. And um, these pieces I don't name, all, you know, ahead of time. I don't kind of, all, with the exception, of course, uh, busts and portraits, you know, I just do. And, um, and then they speak to me, and then I name them. So this one spoke to me. I said, this looks like a Semitic woman, young woman. This is Ruth. This is Ruth from the Bible. And she's gleaning the wheat, as you read about in the Bible. And um, she and the head fell off. So I said, well, I love this head. I'm going to cast separately just the head. So I had something called Ruth, comma, a study. So a study means that, you know, it's one part of a, a body or, it's, you know, a hand or something. It's a study for a bigger piece. And I had it cast in bronze, and uh, it was in the gallery at Portland Art Gallery, and Missy uh, at the gallery, uh, one of your wonderful artists uh, there, Dunaway. Um, Missy apparently loved it, and she, because it was Ruth's study, and I think it was a at the time when... Um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, had just passed away. And she interpreted it, I say, as it being Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I love the fact as an artist, which and a wonderful artist that she is, that she wanted to buy that piece for herself. And But she thought it was RBG. So then that gave me the idea, okay, I see that uh, she is Semitic, and there's no doubt about that, and has this character uh, that inspired me to think of her as a biblical, uh, you know, uh, uh, character. I had we have little glasses now, and I've put a kind of a 
I've forgotten the word they use for the like a necklace that the female Supreme Court justices have adapted for their um, uh, um, uh, robe uh, around the, the neck. And uh, we now have that piece called RBG. Uh, and it's a kind of a separate item from Ruth, <laughs> a study. Long story, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I love that you have so many different types of connections in so many different areas. I mean, in our very short conversation, you've talked about foreign policy, you've talked about connections with presidents, you've talked about Maine, and it seems like you draw inspiration from multiple different sources. I do. I do. I'm, I, 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 um, I don't like silos. I, I don't, I, I, you know, there are people who say, you know, I'm a medical doctor and I can only tell you about this specialty that I have, which relates to your ears. And, um, that's just not me. And as far as I'm concerned, life is just filled with intersections and I love to connect them. I love to connect people and I love to connect ideas. And um, that uh, uh, with the sculpting, uh, back to the, the point, you know, I am relating to history. Uh, I'm relating to all those mostly male uh, sculptors who came before me, but I am putting my personal mark uh, and, and I want to leave a legacy. So I really appreciate history. Um, and, and when it comes to society, I mean, I think we have a responsibility to think not only about ourselves and our kids and our grandkids, but our neighbors and our greater society, and even more so now in this tech digital world that we live into. And so, and I just groove on new ideas and new inputs and making connections. That's my forte. I connect and I see connections where people just don't see it. And sometimes, particularly as a female, you're not taken seriously because of that. You're supposed to kind of stay in your, in your, um, in your, not your groove, but in your category and, you know, get those credentials. And I, I paid the price on those things. I did. I got my credentials from an academic point of view. I got my credentials from, from, you know, my policy world point of view. I've got my credentials from my artistic point of view, but it's the connections. That's where the creation comes. That's where your con personal contribution goes to the to, to to everyone else, and um, uh, you know, I'm I'm very proud when people say to me, Paul, I just love the question you ask. I never would have thought about that, and I like coming out of left field, as they say, and uh, and, and 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 doing that. And the, so, yeah, th thank you for for uh, you know pressing that button with me because. Um, I think that's, I'm proud of that. <laughs> well, I can, I can absolutely relate. I know that as a family medicine doctor, we have to be kind of, as I typically say, kind of horizontal and vertical. We have to always be thinking about things, as I know that your daughter does as a pediatrician, um, kind of not only focused on the individual, the family, the community, you know, education, health, all the intersections. So I think you and I have similar mindsets in that area. Yeah, that's so, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Uh, and I can't wait to introduce you. And again, as I said, I love making the personal connections too. I feel like I'm like a, one of those old fashioned telephone operators. I don't know if you remember, you're too young, but there was a Lily Tomlin skit where she was an operator with the, the headphones and she's pressing, pulling in the in and out of the buttons and the wires to connect people. And she's saying, Mr. Vidal, Mr. Vidal. And that was Gore Vidal, the famous uh, author at the time. But she was making those 
con- telephone connections, and I love to get people together and uh, and have them riff off each other and learn from each other. And uh, I think it's a little bit of my southernness too. Um, the, 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 uh, that I like to make those personal connections. And of course, there's this famous thing about Jewish geography. When Jewish people, and I'm Jewish, uh, um, basically uh, start talking to, oh, you're from that town? Do you know so and so? And it's not just, you know, the town in your, uh, here in, in the United States, it's the towns from which you came. And that's, I want to say something about um, our American community, uh, and I really have to because we're at a moment right now um, where we're pulled in intellectually, emotionally, politically, uh, socially to what's going on in in Ukraine. Um, We here in America, we are a nation of immigrants. And if you don't appreciate how much that shapes our American psyche, no matter what state we're from, um, or political, uh, you know, party we might uh, associate with uh, or be associated with, we are coming from somewhere else. And so we as a nation are always going to be involved, interested, concerned, telling people, what they ought to be doing in other countries. And um, uh, that, that was really the contribution I made in my, my academic work to explain that you can't understand our domestic politics if you don't understand, and our foreign policy, if you don't understand those immigrant roots or those religious ties that we have. And... Um, but that goes back to making those connections between foreign and domestic, you know, between ourselves personally. And, and again, getting back to the art, uh, that's a universal. That's a universal t- desire to create. It's a universal desire and a personal one on my part that I share with the universe to take my hands and tangibly try to shape something which um, uh, gives an an inspiration, which is an intangible, um, which tries to speak uh, without using words to uh, the viewer uh, and, um, and, and, and communicate that way as well. So it's interesting. We're communicating thanks to, uh, you know, the digitization of, 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 of world today, 2022. Um, and, but we're talking about universal thoughts uh, that, that go back forever. And yesterday I was at a, a lecture at the, you know, the ambassador of Norway. I was invited to go to hear about the Arctic and the melting of the Arctic and climate change. And we were talking about uh, the study of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago here on Earth and, you know, and what we've gone through. And so I just think all of these things I don't know, they were laid inside my head and hopefully they come out in some way, um, uh, you know, in, in our conversations and our connections um, verbally uh, and also tangibly with the sculptures. Well, I don't want to let you go before asking you about the piece that's behind me in the studio today which is uh, a dancer. And I'd like you to tell me a little bit about this. Wow. Um, You're really indulging the total egotistical, I mean, anyhow. Um, So the dancer is the dancer. I have always danced. And my parents, you know, I bless them. 
and appreciate the fact that in, in Memphis, Tennessee, they made sure that their kids <laughs> had every, everything they possibly could. Uh, and that included the art school and dance. And so I started out as a, just a, as a tumbler, as an acrobat, and then um, attended uh, ballet, classical ballet classes. I was the youngest member of the Memphis Civic Ballet <laughs> <laughs> but I, it, I, I, I didn't. Uh, but my mother made it very clear I was going to college, and so ballet was not going to be my career. And uh, uh, but it is continued to be my love, my passion, um, among others. And I'm happy to say that my uh, granddaughter is uh, who's now 14 has been at the School of the American Ballet, uh, you know, the, of the New York City Ballet, and I'm kind of living vicariously, of course, through her. And um, uh, the piece that uh, you're talking about, uh, I did without a model, and it's very, very hard. And you know, it's. It's very hard because, you know, you want to get the anatomy right. You want to get the feelings right. But, you know, the whole idea of trying to defy gravity, um, which is what ballet does, and still deal with the engineering realities that um, you've got to have a piece that's going to stand up physically uh, in, some, in, in, in your home or garden, uh, is uh, a challenge. And I had to use mirrors and basically contort myself every once in a while, you know, because the piece, as you can see, she's in a, you know, an arabesque, but in, in, in an attitude is what it's called when your knee is bent. Uh, and, it's in, in, and it's in the back and she's on one foot. And uh, so, talk about acrobats! <laughs> I was, you know, in the in the in in my studio, like you're doing a little bit of that. And uh, you know, I would take pictures of ballerinas and try to use that. But it's it's not the same as having a model. But so that's the piece. And then I had this idea after doing it. Um, it was a little re much related to this piece. Um, which is Ma jeune fille avec chapeau fleuri après Rodin, and where the I decided after I had done the piece that she needed to be wearing something because she was sitting very prim and proper, and so I kind of came up with this idea of do, a hat. Uh, so I've never seen any any bronze where you know you can take the the hat off or on. The same thing with the uh, the ballerina that that you have. There's a little skirt that I made, um, but you know there's a snap there. You can take the skirt off just like you can take the hat off. And the skirt idea came from the Degas. That came from Degas, as you know, the the little dancer, the famous little dancer with her arms behind her back, standing uh, in a wonderful pose. Um, that he, Degas, or somebody, they, there's a, a, both a skirt and in the, her braid, her hair in the back, there's, um, cloth made almost like, um, gauze, um, cheesecloth, um, ribbon in her hair. So that, I kind of got that idea, and uh, sometimes I like it with the skirt, and sometimes I like just to see the body and the anatomy without the uh, the skirt. Um, so it's it's just a, a long story. I hope not too long. <laughs> well, I'm enjoying all of your stories, and I know that people are going to want to see your pieces. So I. I hope that they are able to make the trip up to the Portland Art Gallery because I, in person, they're they're quite impressive. They're lovely, also on the website, the Portland Art Gallery website. But but in person, they're in person, they're impressive. And I can't tell you how many times I've actually gone into the gallery myself and said, "Oh, look at this! It's wonderful! Oh, look at this! It's wonderful!" And 
And so I've appreciated the time that I've had to talk to you today about the work that you do and actually meet the person behind the work. Well, I appreciate the time meeting you too. And I realized since I talked about uh, this piece, I didn't mention this one, which is Genevieve, who I, we've been talked about at the beginning about the, the doctor. This is the doctor as a child. <laughs> That's uh, when I didn't have models. My kids were <laughs> were submit. I submitted them to the the, the requirement of you know sitting still <laughs> long enough to do that. So this is the doctor I was telling about telling about earlier. Uh, so thank you, and I agree with you. When I come to that Portland Art Gallery, I just love seeing my fellow artists and all of their beautiful creations in a gorgeous setting. Uh, Thank you for your, uh, I considered hospitality every time I, I go in. It, it, it's a treat. Well, thank you for telling me that your daughter has been watching over our conversation because now we've, uh, you've enabled me to make that additional connection. So when I actually meet her in person, I, I'll say, I've seen you before, just in a, in a slightly different form. <laughs> Amen. That's perfect. <laughs> I haven't seen you before yet. I've been speaking today with artist Paula Stern, and as I've mentioned, you can go to the Portland Art Gallery to see her work or go to the Portland Art Gallery website. I'm Dr. Lisa Belisle. You've been listening to or watching Radio Maine today with artist Paula Stern. Thank you for coming in to my virtual space. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a pleasure. Hope to see you soon in person.